Hello, everybody. Um, thanks, thanks very much, Cameron. Great to great to see everyone, and good to see from the chat that we've got uh, people from around the world here. So I won't say good morning. Um, uh, as Cameron says, I, I focus these days a lot more on education, but I also continue to have a real passion and focus around um, health, including global health issues. And of course, um, education alongside health are perhaps those two pillars of human capital that often gets neglected and um, deserve a lot more focus and attention, of course, which COVID in some ways is helping, but in many ways is challenging. So over the next hour, we're going to talk about um, the wider context and about innovation in this field and, and a real focus on funding and financing in incentives for drugs and diagnostics and also as Cameron said thinking about the issues of access as well so the kind of the logistics the planning the management um, the rollout of initiatives as well as um, the R&D end of the NTD field we'll talk later perhaps a little bit about um, the roadmap of the WHO and some of the wider um, challenges um, but we're going to start by perhaps talking a little bit with with uh, the four panelists about um, what they're seeing, what their organizations are doing currently, and then we'll sort of um, explore in detail more some of the common themes. And I'd encourage you all uh, watching from now on, please do um, switch from your kind greetings to kind of um, throwing out some questions that I'll try to weave into our discussion um, in the coming uh, minutes. So please do start posting your reflections and particularly questions for the, the panel. So a reminder with me today, we've got Olawale Ajose, Head of Access for uh, DNDI. Uh, we've got Hayato Urabe, who's Senior Director of Investment Strategy at the GHIT Fund in Japan, Margot Warren, Government Engagement and Policy Manager at the Access to Medicine Foundation and Pauline Beatty, the Operations Manager at EDCTP, the European Clinical Trials Platform. Let's, let's begin maybe at the sort of the, um, as it were, partly the upstream end, uh, R&D, perhaps with DNDI and Ola Wale. Just sort of bring us up to date, particularly for perhaps some folks who are not so familiar with DNDI, about uh, the organisation and uh, how you've been evolving and what some of your significant um, projects are that you're focusing on at the moment. Great. Let me just start by saying a big thank you to the organisers of this meeting for um, having me here. Um, for those that do not know, DNDI is, is an R&D organization uh, focusing on, you know, neglected disease. And uh, we've been in existence for many years now. And, uh, you know, we, we work across just a wide range of disease areas. Our portfolio keeps growing and growing and growing. And so I would encourage everyone to, um, to go on the website and, uh, and look at what we're doing. Um, when it comes to, to access, right, we are... I mean, we recognize that as an organization, um, the impact of the work we do on R&D will be very limited if we don't ensure that these products that we work on get into the hands of the patients. And so as an organization, it's very important. We weave access essentially into, into our project, projects from the very beginning, from the way we develop the TPPs to the way we, you know, develop our access plans. You know, access is, is really front and center in, um, in everything that we do. But we also recognize that, that you know, the access is not, is, not, uh, is not something that can be done by one organization alone, right? Um, it essentially takes a village to solve the access issues on NTDs. You need um, NGOs, you need the government, you need funders, you need everyone. And so for us, partnerships is key. And uh, you know, within our plans, our access plans, we we do we try to do a good job identifying, you know, partners that we can work with. You know, where the gaps are, who is going to fill those gaps, and um, and and uh, you know, essentially the roles that the governments will play. And so let me stop there. I I, I guess you know that answers your question, um, Andrew. And you know, hand the mic back to you. And just, and just uh just bring us up to date what are the kind of the most recent um innovations and approaches that you've been rolling out right um well i mean i was, i'll say that to date there's been a really big focus as as all of you know on you know just co-financing research and development for, for ntds you know where big pharma wouldn't traditionally invest because it's simply not commercially viable 
And, you know, in the last few years, we've seen this just significant inflow of, you know, bilateral, multilateral funding from the UK government, the Japanese, the Koreans, just to name a few. And this has resulted in this, you know, just a lot more activity and buzz in the field of R&D. And I believe it's very important that we continue to fund this work. Where we see the biggest gaps is in financing for access activities. And I think, I would say the biggest opportunity that, that we see here, and this is one area that we've, we've been working on, is looking at ways where we can lower the cost of programming, you know, so that, you know, financiers, so governments, donors can achieve more with the same level of funding or even with less. So the, the, there are just a couple of obvious, I would say, not so innovative ideas that I would just like to start off with. Um, so one thing that we're, we've been looking at is, is how do we reduce essentially the cost of you know, drugs and diagnostics so that we can free up funds for more procurement and for other things, right? As all of you know, the NTD market is, is extremely small when you compare it to other disease areas like you know, HIV, TB, malaria, and so on. And interestingly, what you find is a lot of fragmentation in, in just the way organizations and governments uh, procure their products. And what this has resulted in is, is essentially companies having the, you know, the room or the opportunity to charge higher prices, you know, because they essentially don't get the economies of scale that they would ordinarily get, you know, if they get large orders. And an example where we see this is, is, is with miltepocin, right? You know, it's a drug for treating leash. Um, you know, not many people know that this, uh, this drug um, is manufactured by one company that has uh, essentially two pricing systems, right? There's a 150 euro price tag if you order below one batch and they give you a discounted price if you order um, above one batch, right? Now, because individual organizations um, usually need less than one batch, what essentially happens is that they get charged the high price, right? However, if imagine if we could all come together to pull our orders together and you know order order several batches at the same time, this would effect, effectively lead to you know just like savings that we can plow back into the programs, whether it's for procurement or you know just like you know trainings and so on. And so this is one aspect area where we see an opportunity, right? The need for organizations. To, to come together and pool their resources for procurement so that we can achieve efficiencies which will translate into cost savings. And we are currently speaking with WHO and other organizations to see how we can use existing platforms to essentially um, you know, create the system. The second point, and then I'll stop here, is, is that, you know, and this is somewhat related to the first point, is, is that we also see the need for, your, for us to use and leverage you know, market market shipping instruments more in the, in the NTD space, right? You know, market shipping tools such as advanced market commitments, buy downs, and so on have worked wonders um, in reducing the price um, of drugs and you know just improving the broader market dynamics in small niche uh, niche markets. So, as an example, you know, the pediatric HIV market has has, has greatly benefited from from these sorts of um, mechanisms. But we don't see enough of these tools being used in the NTD space. I honestly don't know why. I think maybe it's a function of just the way things have been set up from the very beginning, but there's definitely room for us to, to leverage more on these tools. If I use the same example of new Tepocin, right? DNDI, you know, we've been trying for several years now to, to get cheaper generics in, into the market. Um, um, and we haven't had very little, we, we've had very little success in convincing these companies to, you know, um, to come into the market, right? Because essentially they're asking us for multi-year volume commitments. And again, as an organization, we don't have enough volumes to make those commitments. But assuming if we could all come together, then, you know, something like a volume commitment would, would make sense. Um, and unfortunately, you know, market shaping organizations that would, you know, make these sorts of investments, um, just don't pay attention to NTDs. So, so I think another opportunity here is to ensure that we can put NTD, you know, just market shipping opportunities in the radar of these 
you know, market shipping organizations such as you know United Save, you know Med Access, and so on, and essentially convince them to add entities to you know their portfolio of of, of uh, investments. So these are the the two I would say the two um, more immediate uh, things that we're looking at. It's you know pool procurement to 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 realize savings that we can plow back into programs. And, and just to use market shipping instruments um, more effectively um, within the NTD space. Okay, thanks, and we'll we'll definitely come back to those those two points you raised. But let me let me now switch perhaps to um, Pauline to hear a little bit from your perspective. Obviously, clinical trial coordination um, funding is is absolutely central to innovation. Now, tell us tell us how um, your perspective is and what your organisation has been doing to try to help mobilise greater support and action. Thanks very much for that. Um, EDCTP is a program and public partnership over forty European governments and sixteen African governments, and with our funding, try to accelerate the development of new and improved products uh, for treatment and diagnosis, also prevention of poverty-related diseases. We have a portfolio of about 400 million euros in terms of grants. About uh, 70 million of this is in the NIDs. Um, I think following on from uh, what was said, I think partnership really is key to driving innovation here. Um, funding is very limited in this field. I think there are a few incentives uh, to uh, drive forward. And so it's very important that what funding there is, is coordinated as much as possible. So our whole organization is based on partnership. And also to pick up on the previous point, it's about equitable, equitable partnership in research as well as in, in um, uh, the access to products that result from that. So all of our projects are uh, done by European and African partnerships because innovation is not only driven from the north, I would say. And also, I think uh, on the previous point uh, about the uh, WHO roadmap as well, and the need, I think, to involve much more the disease affected countries. Uh, this is something EDCTP is trying to do, because really we are working, I suppose, from phase one trials right through to how does one implement uh, new products? And that means really that we are engaging with a range of funders um, and not just, I suppose, the, the innovation uh, funders. Of course, we're working with uh, um, uh, companies, uh, DNDI, of course, we're supporting quite a number of projects. We have some projects that uh, are co-funded by GHIT as well, but also we're trying to work at the other end with development agencies, with African governments, um, to make sure that um, there is a path that goes all the way. I think one other point that I would make in terms of our uh, approach is it is about networking. Uh, and, and so we have a number of regional uh, networks uh, in Africa as well. And just to pick up on the point about um, concerted action for procurement, of course, we, we're working in sub-Saharan Africa and our regional networks of researchers are linked also to policymakers and, uh, you know, governments and regulators, which I think can really help uh, the process of ensuring that one, that uh, research is supported uh, and is approved and then it is then uh, taken forward as well. And I think just also to say that, um, of course, as well as funds for innovation, I would say in a field uh, like neglected diseases in particular, it is really important that there is an environment in which the research can take place. And so we are also making efforts to strengthen the, the research enabling environment. And this is also in support of ethics and regulatory structures uh, in countries, uh, facilities in labs, uh, uh, um, in sub-Saharan Africa, so that, um, that you know, the whole pathway is there to allow research to take place equitably, equitably uh, in a sustainable fashion. And also uh, just to build on that point, if NTDs um, 
just a, a single focus on one disease in a single project is not really providing a sustainable solution uh, that would enable other NTDs to be tackled. I'll stop there. Thank you. And just to that point, so yes, you you mentioned very good points about the need for coordination and the potential cost as well as speed uh, benefits of, of tight integration in countries and the regulatory framework and so on. Any bright spots you've seen recently in terms of um, new approaches where there is tighter coordination, maybe even between different uh, diseases or drugs, for example? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we are we are seeing a lot more in terms of um, um, countries uh, doing research, perhaps starting off in one particular disease and then the facilities are there to switch to other diseases, including NCDs as well. I think in terms of the regulatory structures, uh, the organisation AVAREF is trying to coordinate uh, and share uh, between different countries to allow faster, uh, well, faster or more efficient, I would say, uh, review of proposals uh, uh, in different countries, because currently the approach of uh, getting approval in one country, then going to the next country, it, it's not really coordinated. So I, I think that that is definitely there. And in terms of our organization, we have uh, partnered quite a lot with a number of perhaps uh, smaller funders, Leprosy Research Initiative, um, uh, Mundo Sano and others and, and that I think has really this pooling of resources it can happen in other ways of course not just through EDCTP um, I think that can really help to make an impact in fields where there is very little money. Okay thanks uh, maybe hi Otto let's just hear a little bit from your perspective and obviously you amongst others do partly fund so that's a, a very different and useful um, perspective to take what, what are you seeing and what opportunities and what more would you like the whole sector perhaps to be doing in order to create more opportunities for innovation great um can you hear me okay yep that's fine okay great yeah um so uh do fund for those of um uh, participants who, who don't know us, uh, we're in a world, we're a public-private partnership uh, from Japan, and we invest in um, R&D for development of um, drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics, starting from a very early stage of uh, screening different compounds all the way to regulatory approval. And also, we do some access work, we don't, although we don't really actively invest in them. Um, but um, where we come into the story, I guess, uh, um, of course, we do pool investment from multiple sectors. Uh, we're uh, public-private partnerships. So we're funded by Japanese government, UNDP, um, different foundations, including the Gates Foundation, um, as well as Wellcome Trust, and different um, industry uh, private sector um, players. And uh, we basically pool their funding. Um, of course, each funders have different incentives, um, so to speak. But uh, we pool, pool them all together and then to put in them into this, uh, what, what uh, is called, a, I guess, a pull, um, a push mechanism of uh, partnership. So, so people would, uh, so we would invest or give grants to different um, research for, you know, NTDs, malaria, and TB, and, uh, and uh, develop um, drugs, uh, vaccines, and diagnostics would would develop. And you know, we we do have very active um pipeline um you know just like uh well while i was saying you know they have big, you know we have big pipeline they have big pipeline you know some of them we um collaborate um together and um of course we are active in in you know pulling all the um resources together into this push mechanism but we have to also be aware of uh the pull incentive or the pull mechanism looking at from the um access end because the R&D side, yes, we, we look at the global pipeline and we look at the different um, priorities and uh, we know where the gaps are in terms of we know uh, where the drugs or diagnostics or vaccines are needed in different uh, um, disease diseases. But at the end of the day, uh, when the products gets uh, developed uh, to the end, um, to the end as in regulatory approval, they will still obviously have to consider all the um, access um, considerations and of course um, access consideration itself is is very um, is complex with many different stakeholders but at the same time the R&D end it does have uh, very mixed uh, stakeholders as well 
So uh, I like to kind of look at it, you know, uh, R&D and um, access and development as being two sides of the same coin, each side requiring uh, a lot of different um, coordination uh, for efficiency, um, cohesion, and um, and all that would be possible um, um, only by rightly coordinating and also sharing um, ideas, um, sharing ideas of you know successes, but not only successes, but uh, failures as well, so that you can learn from what what didn't work, so that people would not make the same mistake. And sharing failures is not always the <laughs> easiest thing. Um, so um, um, so. Yes, and, and you can only share um, failures if if everyone trusts each other and you know, work towards the same goal. So having that um, pathway to the end would be very important with everyone having the same mindset so that we can all work together. So yeah, uh, in essence, we have to all coordinate and you know, trust each other so that that necessary information can be shared so that everyone can go forward um, together. And aren't you seeing any fresh signs of, of willingness or appetite from existing or potential new funders that you work with to, to scale up? So, so we, we work on um, you know, five-year increments. Uh, so we started in 2013 and we, uh, we were going through the, uh, we we're going to have the second replenishment, so to speak, um, coming up in 2023. And of course, we're, we're looking um, um, at the, uh, you know, scaling up. Obviously, we will continue our core mission, uh, investing in and giving grants to um, NTDs, malaria diagnostics for uh, diagnostics um, drugs and um, vaccines. But in order for us to really create an impact, um, those considerations will need to be put in place um, in order to create uh, an impact. And uh, you know, with only um, two hundred million dollars. Uh, of funding that we have uh, currently invested you know, since 2013, in order for us to fully invest in the access portion, that's probably not going to be enough. So I think uh, you know it's either us in expanding the scope or us uh, working together with um, access stakeholders so that we can work um, together. And you know we don't want to spread ourselves um, too thin. So you know experts, we should work with the experts. We're already. Um, product development experts, so we should work together and how we um, how our intentions align. We have to obviously look at the TPP from early on in the um, um, R and D continuum. Of course, we have to look at the access and develop um, access and delivery at the at, you know even in the early stage of um, um, R and D. So, so yes, we're thinking of expanding, but I think it would be probably more it would be much more efficient if we were to work with um, um, experts. I think probably create much bigger impact. So, Margot, the Access to Medicines Foundation, you look a lot at, obviously, the different activities of, of pharma companies. Uh, does that leave you at the moment optimistic? Are you seeing any scaling up or new focus around their support, uh, different parts of the, uh, of the, of the uh, chain, as it were, in terms of R&D and rollout of uh, products for neglected diseases? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, thanks again to everyone as well for having me and to the other panelists. I think there have been a lot of really great statements made and, and to our chair as well. Thank you. Um, just a little uh, overview, I guess, about our work and, and what we've been up to uh, before I dive into your question. The Access to Medicine Foundation guides and incentivizes pharmaceutical companies to do more for access uh, for people living in low and middle income countries. So we are a research foundation and we're totally independent from the pharmaceutical industry and that enables us to kind of evaluate and incentivize them in a different way. We are funded by uh, governments and private foundations. So Dutch and UK and the research that we've done over the past over decade now has been able to track some of these movements across the many, uh, largest or least pharmaceutical companies we measure and see where there has been progress in the space of NTDs as well as in comparison uh, to other disease areas. We have 82 diseases, conditions, and pathogens in the scope of our work. And this also enables us to draw on other disease areas where there has also been some innovation and see where it could be applied uh, to other uh, disease areas like NTDs. 
So over the past 10 years or so, uh, now with the publication of the 2021 index uh, that was just this past January, we have seen movement, which is positive. It's definitely clear that it's in response to uh, a few different key elements, and I'll, I'll touch on them in my presentation later on this morning as well in, in the next session. But just to highlight a few points, I think it is really beneficial. Uh, we've seen when there is a clear agenda in place set by the global health community, that's when we see companies really understand what their uh, roles and responsibilities should be and where they understand uh, where more work is needed. But we do find that when there are these market shaping mechanisms in place, when there's investment um, in a public-private partnership uh, for R&D for neglected tropical diseases, we do see action and that's that's promising. It means that those initiatives are working and it's evidence that those, that those PDPs, product development partnerships, and that those um, innovative funds are working. So that in itself is positive, I think. Um, it's a reinforcement of the, the great work that's being done thus far and to be able to bring new products to market. Uh, we have seen two new products um, recently for NTD, so that's great. We know it takes a long time. It's not something that just happens overnight. And so to see new products you know, coming to market is really demonstrating that these PDPs are effective. Um, but I think there's definitely a lot more room to grow. And I think there are some interesting lessons learned from other areas where we've seen sort of similar issues with commercial viability, especially in low and middle income countries. So AMR, antimicrobial resistance is, is one kind of area where I would draw some similar comparisons in that um, there is a need to encourage companies to participate in R&D in a way that uh, we've seen some companies actually retract um, and we need, you know, that effort to continue similarly with NTD. So it's about figuring out what has worked in the past, what has really pushed companies further and how we can replicate that and expand on that uh, and make sure that companies are continuing to come to the table, that no one's leaving the space um, and that more companies are becoming engaged. We've seen more engagement over the years, as I mentioned um, with the 2012 London Declaration being pretty instrumental with PDPs coming into play and with new funds. It, it has pushed companies further, but we need more of that. Uh, and I think there's been some really great comments thus far uh, from the other panelists about looking at it as a you know two-sided coin. R&D is incredibly important. We need these new innovative medicines and diagnostics and vaccines where appropriate. But we also need to look at once the uh, projects are approved, how are they becoming available? How quickly are they becoming available? And to whom? What's the reach? And I think what's really important to point out is that we find time and time again that access planning is so incredibly important while projects you know, are in development so that once they're approved immediately, uh, the companies can kind of hit the ground running and make sure that they're available to everyone who needs them and that it's not an afterthought. So embedding those access plans and provisions uh, really early on in the contractual agreements for some of these new partnerships is super important. And as we see a little bit of progress, I think, in, in new and innovative funds like Adjuvant, for example, that's uh, raising capital for, um, say, Hookworm, for example, is amongst the disease scope that, that they've committed to. I think, again, as other panelists have said, it's important to continue to embed more diseases, um, especially NTDs, in some of those new funds to encourage them to open up their scope a little bit more, to focus on other NTDs, and to make sure that once they're developed, it's very clear and it's it's in a contractual agreement that they will make sure the companies involved that these products will be available uh, to those who need them. So I'll pause there um, and see if there's any other follow-up questions. I just on that uh, the hookworm initiative you mentioned. So, so what do you think was the secret of success that mobilised funding uh, into that field to get more R and D into a neglected space? Uh, yeah, it's it's a really interesting and and fairly new initiative. So, I think the idea of raising capital at that level is quite you know interesting, and I think it's a space that we'll probably see more players in in the near future. In that respect, it was very positive to also see some pharma companies put money on the table as well. Uh, and that's something that's a little bit new and interesting as well. And it, it relates back to what I was saying about some of the parallels with the AMR space and the AMR Action Fund that also had companies bring money to the table, some of which were not actually involved in, 
in that particular R&D space, but recognize that it's an important issue and that they should be involved in some capacity. So with Adjuvant, there were many players involved. There were a lot of you know philanthropic donors, but companies also. So I think that's an interesting model to look at as well. Uh, when we're thinking about big funds and, and raising a lot of capital, who is involved in, and what is the role that they can play? I mean, that's certainly one of the one of the more interesting and unusual um, recent developments in funding, isn't it, in neglected diseases, which has been, of course, kind of not really the core focus. I mean, I wonder, we might just think, put this whole uh, discussion in the context, of course, of COVID and the, and the risks, but potentially also if any of you've got thoughts on some of the opportunities that COVID might provide, whether it's sort of piggybacking the NTD case um, or other sort of uh, examples of partnership and cooperation that have come through COVID that could be applied to NCDs. I don't know whether Oluwale, you've got any views on on that. Um, it's, a, it's an important question. Um, I mean, I think what COVID forces us to think about is is integration, right? That you can't just think about one disease; you need to think about the patient, right? Um, so the patient today might have COVID, but that same patient might be struggling with other things. And so much resources have been is being pumped into into just the COVID response at the moment, whether it's you know to improve infrastructure or to buy diagnostic devices, you know, or to train and so on. And I think one one opportunity is to see how we can leverage. And it goes to I think a question that has been posed here around. UHC is how do we leverage programs that are better resourced um, and use that as, as a you know springboard right to uh, to to fund you know gaps within the NTD um, NTD uh, disease areas um, you know and you know so it it could be as simple as you know they're rolling out PCR devices across Africa now to in places where maybe PCR devices never existed. These areas might also have uh, NTD cases that might require the same devices. How can we start to to leverage, right? Um, or things around trainings, things around just like even the advocacy, right? You know, you are most politicians that never wanted to hear about health. Now they are paying attention because everyone is suffering. This is a unique opportunity for us to not just talk about COVID, but also gradually start to include um, include other topics. So, so I do think COVID presents a, a unique opportunity to leverage. On paper, it does, um, you know, but in practice, I'm not sure to what extent uh, did, did this would work. Honestly, it's yet to be seen. Yeah, Margo, any any thoughts on that? And and both both the the challenge of COVID, but those possibilities, as Olo Olo is saying, for, for kind of springboarding uh, to connect back to NTDs? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think it's a great point to raise that uh, also what Cameron said at the beginning of the session, just in the intro, that really the attention of a global health community now has expanded so much. Uh, and as well, I think People understand what it means to focus on global health and the importance it has in all countries of the world and making sure that healthcare systems in one country are strong enough because it does have implications when we look at the spread of COVID. And we know that health system strengthening is such an important element and that universal healthcare is, is critical to make sure that those healthcare systems are strong and that populations are healthy and less vulnerable to uh, issues like COVID-19. And I think um, there is this space right now um, for you know new conversations about NTDs that maybe haven't had the, the airtime in the past. And people are focused on global health and they're interested in global health in a way that they haven't necessarily been in the past. And we have this very interesting window of opportunity to push forward these other disease areas that do really require a lot of attention. Um, and the expectations of pharma companies are changing as well. I think people now even at you know, many dinner tables, names that were previously only kind of discussed within global health circles, people are saying, oh, what's, you know, Pfizer doing about this? And what's AstraZeneca doing about this? And so there's more pressure as well um, on these companies to do more. And I think people understand better what their role is in all of this, and, and especially in the R&D space, what their role is and how movement can be uh, really expedited quite quickly. And that's 
another promising thing we've seen with COVID is that, you know, vaccines typically take 10 years to develop and we've seen them done in less than one. So if that can be done in the vaccine space, we can apply in theory the same logic to other disease areas where there's been a lot more stagnation, especially in the NT NTD space where, you know, there is a lot in the pipeline, but it's not moving fast enough. And if you have this global attention on the issues and we can explain now, you know, what the importance is to the average person, they get it more now. And, and this movement can be expedited in the pipeline as well. And we can push things out more quickly uh, than we have in the past and reduce some of that stagnation. Pauline, are you seeing any potential new opportunities, whether through the debate around UHC or COVID, uh, to kind of link more tightly into NTD work? Uh, yes, I think so. I mean, unfortunately, as has been said, um, the focus on COVID has taken a focus away from other diseases, but exactly as was said in terms of the possibilities to accelerate uh, um, in other diseases. I think, again, um, concerted action has been seen much more, uh, including, I guess, across, I'm thinking in terms of sub-Saharan Africa, the, the role of Africa CDC, I think is very important and could be important in uh, driving through advances. Um, and, and again, I think um, the linking up of regulatory agencies across Africa as well, because everything is being done at high speed. Um, it, it's, uh, and as was already said, I think the advocacy and attention. So I, I do think that um, possibly not specific to the disease, but perhaps some structural changes or improvements could help to take, um, help advance developments in other areas. Uh, Hayato, do you want to come in on this? I know uh, the Japanese government, of course, has placed quite a lot of emphasis on UHC, hasn't it, as part of its global health policies. I don't know whether that's trickling down from what you're seeing or any of the projects you've been involved with. So um, in, in terms of um, UHC, of course, um, you know, JHIT um, obviously is being funded by the Japanese government, but uh, also the same, same um, investment. Uh, I mentioned UNDP earlier, but uh, there's money that comes from the Japanese government also to UN UNDP where they have what they call an access and delivery um, partnership uh, where we uh, work together and we created a platform called Uniting Efforts for Innovation Access and De Delivery back in 2019, where we bring up together all the um, R&D stakeholders and access stakeholders and funder funders all in the same room to discuss you know, what would be the best way to uh, realize uh, UHC to increase um, coordination um, amongst the stakeholders uh, in the field and identify different issues that uh, might be there to find uh, a potential solution together, all from the different aspects, you know, from the R&D um, stakeholders perspective, funders perspective, and what we call the access stakeholders um, perspective to make this, uh, uh, if I use um, Pauline's uh, word, you know, concerted action um, by making the you know plans um, together um as for the uh, the uh, topic on, on the covid you know we do have uh, we have seen uh, um, uh, a lot of us mentioning about leveraging um, funding but of course uh, there's uh, aspect of leveraging different technologies that are being uh, that have been developed uh, for instance we, we did have a, we do have a, a TB diagnostics in in our uh, portfolio right now which uh, which have been um, repurposed or repositioned to be used for um, COVID um, application as well. So some of the, not, not all the technologies um, can be repurposed, um, but uh, for instance, for diagnostics, if you were to find a very good, um, let's say lateral flow um, assay platform, then all you have to maybe work on is the antibody pairing, which might have a versatility um, um, that you can actually uh, consider about leveraging that technology itself to be applicable for um, new and emerging diseases, um, for instance. So, so let's go back to Oluwale. You, you made a, that point earlier, which we've heard a few times around pooled procurement. So to provide the stability and the volume that could drive um, more affordable access. The tension, though, isn't it, is, is between um, you know, creating the volume and the stability on the one hand. But um, I know historically there's been a lot of resistance by individual countries, for example, to give up their own control over procurement and distribution. How to how to reconcile those two sides? 
Yeah, it's a really good question. So I, I think there are two ways to look, to, to think about pool, pool procurement, right? So there is, you know, we're, we're going to put all our orders into one pot and there will be a central entity that is procuring on our behalf, which is usually a difficult sell to government. And then there is what maybe I shouldn't call pool procurement, it's more of a coordinated procurement, right? Where countries, you know, and partners place their orders the way they would, but the negotiations are done jointly so that everyone benefits um, from the potential pricing. You know, and I think when we think about pool procurement, really what we're saying is coordinated procurement, you know? Um, if Kenya wants to procure its, its drugs and diagnostics, they, they should. And I don't think it makes sense. <laughs> what we're saying is that you know, Kenya should be part of any negotiations. Um, um, I think, in at least in the short to medium term, that is, in my opinion, what would fly. You know, um, get telling countries to to hand over their procurement systems to one single entity might be a hard uh, might be a hard sell. Uh, Margot, do you, I saw you nodding a bit on that. Any any views? Pool procurement. Uh, yeah, I think it's a it's a definitely a factor that we've seen really influence companies. So, for example, uh, with Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, negotiating on behalf of multiple uh, different eligible countries, um, the Global Fund, uh, Gold Procurement has worked really well, and it's definitely encouraged companies to come to the table. Something that we look at in the Access to Medicine Index is equitable pricing strategies um, on a country-by-country -country level. And we, time and time again, find that what we refer to as supranational agreements, so Gavi Global Fund multilaterals coming together, um, we find that the terms that they're able to secure are far greater than what an individual country government would be able to secure. So there's definitely evidence that these mechanisms do work and that pooled procurement um, is really beneficial because as you can imagine, it's very difficult for a small country to go up against a big pharmaceutical company that ultimately owns the rights to that product uh, and to be able to negotiate. But it is much easier when you have, you know, multiple countries coming together or a big procurement agency making those negotiations on their behalf and also committing to, you know, a certain amount of volume, um, which again, then you can negotiate prices down in a far greater way than you could on a bilateral basis. So it's definitely something that we've seen um, a lot of response to, and, uh, and it's something that I think would be really interesting to see a, a bigger kind of procurement agency uh, involved in the space of NTDs and to see kind of what, what impacts that might have. Uh, Pauline, there's a question here, I see you on the chat about um, the scope for elevating clinical trial capabilities in lower and middle income countries. You might want to touch on that, but but let me just add in also, the, just coming back to our previous points, I mean, is there any scope for you to also help um, coalesce and drive greater downstream, you know, sort of so post-trial conditionality, as it were, that might sort of encourage greater use of, for example, pool procurement mechanisms? I think we're, we're not as far extended into that area in terms of the procurement aspects, but um, I think that that is all in terms of the post licensure actions. I think that is already happening to a certain extent uh, across the African continent. Uh, there are a lot of um, activities going on, I think, via the African Union. Um, I mean, I think one area just from EDC EDCTP's perspective is um, pharmacovigilance uh, and also looking at, at you know, how uh, the products that, and so we have been supporting a number of networks as well um, in, in different countries on these aspects because there really is no capacity there as well. Um, well, no capacity, this could uh, be strengthened. Um, I think I'll stop on that. In, in terms of 
elevating clinical trials capacity um, or research capacity. I mean, I think that has elevated massively um, in the in the last ten to fifteen uh, years. Um, uh, I think NTDs are quite difficult uh, because of the nature of those diseases in particular countries. But I think it's very much uh, the 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 norm now that um, these research partnerships are 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 not simply led from the north. So I I think there is a lot of uh, capacity. I think what is more difficult now is that uh, uh, thinking from the African perspective is that there are certain geographical regions which are much more lagging behind than others, whereas countries like Kenya, Uganda, South Africa, I mean, they, they have already extremely uh, strong capacity for research, but probably Western Central Africa is, is lagging a bit. So I think more incentive is needed there to ensure that um, that when trials are devised, that they, they are really... Um, involving many countries over. And Hayato, you're, obviously a lot of your focus is on the uh, the upstream R&D catalyzing, but do you see any scope for, um, again, extending that a bit downstream around conditions of access or kind of mechanisms that might stimulate, you know, the pull side, as it were, and the rollout post uh, successful R&D development? You're on, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, okay. So I think what's important um, is for us to be transparent about uh, our pipeline. You know, what's what's coming, um, so that we can coordinate um, better with those uh, uh, experts who can who can really um, consider these um, access and delivery um, perspectives. It's it's you know for us to be fully involved in the. Um, access and delivery um, portion, um, it's it's going to be a little bit of a stretch for us, but it's important for us to um, continue to consider what would be the um, pieces that would be needed to glue the R&D side to the um, access and delivery side for, for us to actually cross the, the, um, the jump over the the, the chasm, so to speak. And um, of course, these um, pool procurement or the volume guarantee targets would really help the um, R and D, um, um, the researchers and uh, the innovators, because for them to actually have some sort of a a goal, not you know, the TPPs are good to see where where the the specifications of uh, uh, what's needed um, at the local level, but uh, having um, volume guarantees would really um, help them to envision what would be the um, end product and how it's going to be really be used um, on the ground level. So I think, um, as I said, it's it's two sides of the same coin. One side cannot directly look over the other, if you, if you use the coin analogy, but uh, um, it's, it's on the backside. So you sh should be able to really um, have the feel of what's needed so you can actually work um, in concert. Uh, Oluwala, there's, there's a couple of questions here about local manufacturing um uh, you know kind of uh, emmanuel here saying that it's now pretty much unaffordable in in a place like nigeria to do this um is that an approach that that makes sense you know to kind of distribute locally um plants for production you're, you're on mute i think can you hear me yep so so my my answer simple answer would be local manufacturing is always not the solution right you might be able to manufacture locally but your your cost price might be higher so your cost of goods might end up being higher than if you were to manufacture from china um so but there are definitely benefits to local manufacturing that go beyond just the cost of one particular drug um, so I would my I would say that you know it's a complex question. Um, there are a bunch of issues, chief of which is financing, and um, and yeah, it's something that need, needs to be looked into. But it's definitely not not an easy one to fix. But there are there are there are drug companies out there in Africa that do fantastic work. I think the gap with local manufacturing has to do with diagnostics. You don't have enough diagnostic manufacturers on the continent. So if there's anyone from the African Development Bank on this call, please invest in um, diagnostic manufacturing. <laughs> Marco, something you'd, you'd share a view on? 
Uh, yeah, certainly. It's something that we look at within the context of the index as well. If, if uh, large R&D-based companies are kind of helping to facilitate local manufacturing and, and the use of tech transfers and things like that. So it certainly is a very complex issue. I think COVID has exacerbated some of the issues around supply chains globally, and especially for active pharmaceutical ingredients um, being concentrated primarily in, in a few regions and countries, mainly India and China. But um, it's something that I think um, can be explored and it, and it should be explored to make sure that that there are, you know, manufacturing facilities um, more, you know, geogra with a bigger geographical range. But I echo the sentiments that it can be very complicated and, and we ultimately would need to make sure that economies of scale could be great enough that the prices would actually be lower than if you were to um, procure from, say, an Indian pharmaceutical company that, that had much larger economies of scale and could lower prices fairly substantially. So unfortunately, we're coming to the end of our session. We think we had some great comments here about the importance of local capacity building in both research and, and manufacturing and questions about this uh, and, and uh, arguments around the importance of um, data sharing and coordination. Um, but I mean, just finally, briefly, perhaps to each of you, I mean, it, it's, it's great to hear, for example, this initiative around adjuvant capital. Um, the reality is, of course, that, um, and, and I think it was you, Margot, earlier talking about antimicrobial resistance of course the difference there is partly bluntly self-interest or um, tools that have a global resonance including richer countries so that offer the opportunity for if you like cross subsidies in the development of new tools um, you know the challenge of course with NTDs as we know is they are by definition diseases of neglected people small um, areas with limited amounts of resource and and it's interesting, even in the NTD roadmap, there's put a, perhaps a, an increasing focus on the role of individual countries themselves to take the lead. So, I mean, how optimistic are all of you about the the need and the, the capacity, the potential for the countries of higher burdens to, to step up more to the mark and prioritise and resource up more in these areas? Uh, who wants to go in? Pauline, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I think I am optimistic. Um, obviously, financial aspects can be difficult, but um, um, we've talked a lot about bringing partners to the table. And I think Hayato uh, talked about where all very different stakeholders were brought together. I think it's really a question of that as well to encourage and bring to the table, um, because I'm not sure that um, that was always uh, uh, done. So think there is capacity um, but of course um, it's about encouraging the dialogue and the partnership. Hayato? Yeah I think uh, just just to uh, uh, piggyback on, 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 on what's been said but uh, I guess increased coordination is good and also uh, something we've also been working on through the uniting efforts is in investment cases so I think uh, if you think about uh, uh, each different country is having to pitch onto their Ministry of Health and Ministry of Finance um, um, to actually allocate uh, sufficient amount of uh, funding for NTDs for uh, I think these are stakeholder and stakeholder strategies. Certain things that are common um, could be done maybe systematically one way can um, one successful case um, can be shared everyone can potentially use similar ways to um, enable this uh, um, this strategy to procure funding for uh, e even for countries with lesser resources um, uh, I think that that those kind of know-hows could be shared and that's what we're striving to develop in the platform we created mm -hmm. Margot um, yeah, I think it certainly will be an important factor in terms of the funding uh, and that if the individual country governments are expected to be footing the bill themselves, then uh, the equitable pricing strategies that the pharma industry is willing to offer will be incredibly critical. And as we were talking about earlier, some of the negotiations 
um, and the the expectation from the pharma industry about what is a, an appropriate price to be charging, if it is a cost, if it is, um, as is now the case in many respects, a donation, I think those need to be factored in and, and it will be you know, incredibly important to make sure that it's possible and sustainable uh, for countries to be able to procure and that the prices aren't so exorbitant that it's just impossible at the end of the day. Okay, voilà. Um, it's a joint responsibility. You know, companies have a responsibility to, to you know, help. Um, and governments certainly need to also step up. And, um, you know, donors for sure um, would need to continue to support this cause. And, and thank God for COVID, right? Because, you know, it's created just this global solidarity. And so I'm, I'm very optimistic. That's great. And uh, and um, Gani Yu, I see here, has made an important point of reminding us actually on one area where there's been lots of focus in innovation and there are there's a need for kind of quite tailored local responses, but anti-venom, um, an interesting area of, of, of activity and development, including, he mentions, the Echitar project uh, on the ground. So um, thank you all for, for, for a great discussion. I mean, huge challenges, as we've discussed, with the distraction of COVID intensifying in many ways the, uh, the kind of the long-standing neglect of the NTD field, but interesting to hear, for example, with adjuvant around antivenom, um, and then some ideas on the more on the access, access management side, including around pool procurement and fresh approaches to partnership. That there is um, some sense of dynamism and optimism about uh, evolutions in the future in a positive direction. So thank you all very much, and thank you everyone for for watching and contributing some great thoughts and questions. And back to Cameron.